another hammer blow for Britain's farmers, the return of foot and mouth disease. It poses no threat to humans, but all affected animals, sickly and weakened, are slaughtered to stop it spreading. Food. Without it, a nation cannot survive. Without a healthy farming industry, this country, like any other, will be left to the mercy of giant food corporations and their private interests, which routinely put profit before their consumers. Food security in an ever-changing world should be the primary focus of any nation. It is the government's responsibility to protect our food supply. But can we really trust our ministers to manage such an important industry given their constant failure to protect the people's interests? If we look at other sectors of government, we can see that whole swathes of public property and services are being mismanaged. So what would make the Ministry of Agriculture any different? In 1988, Edwina Curry sparked outrage when she implied that most of the egg production in the country was infected with salmonella. Despite having no evidence of her claim, the Minister for Health was responsible for a sharp decline in egg consumption and cleared the way for the compulsory slaughter of nearly three million laying hens, putting farms out of business and driving farmers to the point of suicide. During the alleged outbreak, the government's actions were further called into question when it was found that a ministry laboratory was so contaminated with salmonella, it was impossible to know whether any of the specimens were genuinely affected with salmonella or not. During 1986 to 1997, it was claimed that more than 180,000 cattle were infected with bovine spongiform encephalopathy, more commonly known as mad cow's disease. The resulting government action was to slaughter 4.4 million cows, the overwhelming majority being healthy. This gross overreaction has been claimed by many in the farming industry as being motivated by politics and not in the public's health or interest. As we shall discover, both MAF, the Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries and Food, which has since become DEFRA, the Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, seem to have a policy of destroying a greater number of healthy animals when faced with an epidemic. Foot and Mouth was first reported by an abattoir in Essex on Monday the 19th of February 2001. What resulted was the bloodiest event ever to take place in British farming. The resulting slaughter on suspicion policy, administered by the government, oversaw the destruction of more than 11 million animals nationwide. As with previous events, the greater number of animals slaughtered were in fact healthy. At the time of the outbreak, it was the Labour Party, led by Tony Blair, which formed the government of the day. 
Blair's government was called into question over the epidemic. Both he and his ministers had massaged statistics, ignored expert advice, barred those that opposed their decisions from attending official meetings, and brutally slaughtered healthy animals in a bid to get re-elected. Of the 9,515 farms that had their livestock slaughtered, only 2,030 farms were confirmed as being infected. This means that 79% of farms across the country that were culled out during the foot and mouth epidemic were in fact free of the disease. The crisis tore families and communities apart. Both the farming and tourist industries in rural areas were under quarantine. Towns and villages were shut down and many families were unable to leave or return to their homes. Our investigations into this subject led us to Penrith, where we were able to talk with some of the professionals that were working in the industry at the time of the outbreak. What we were looking for was clarification on some of the conflicting facts and details between the rumours in the farming industry and the official story of the government. The government claimed that its actions were proportionate to the risks that the farming industry faced from the epidemic. Those working within the industry have a very different view of events. We were told that from the beginning of the foot and mouth outbreak, MAF put herds into quarantine and began what became a routine slaughter on suspicion, which it claimed was in line with the policy and procedures that resulted from the last outbreak in 1967. Previous governments had dealt with foot and mouth by quickly burying infected carcasses on site, unlike Blair's government, who saw fit to slaughter on suspicion and burn infected bodies on giant pyres off site, all of which were opposed by a 1969 government report which followed the outbreak in 67. In line with this, EU officials had codified procedures which effectively prohibited the burial of diseased carcasses. The government also prohibited the use of vaccinations, supported by the EU, despite the fact that this form of treatment has been widely used by many countries including those within the European Union. Whilst vaccination is a contentious issue, the UK routinely produces and imports vaccinated meat. Whether people are aware of it or not, they are regularly buying meat that has come from animals that have been vaccinated. The government played a huge part in the events of 2001, forming the policies and procedures that veterinarians and farmers had to follow. Whilst we can look at the failure of officials and agents, the true blame falls on the people that were pulling the strings and giving the orders. Tony Blair postponed the local elections until the 7th of June 2001 as his party had come under scrutiny following systematic failures to control the outbreak. Blair knew that any further delay would hamper his election, and so the word went out that outbreaks must decline, and decline they did.
Leading up to the election, the government was concealing the fact that it was killing more animals than at the height of the foot and mouth crisis. In the 10 days preceding the zero cases report, MAF killed more than a quarter of a million animals on more than 1,000 farms. During that week, an average of 32,000 animals a day were slaughtered, most of which were not infected. The government's chief scientific advisor, Professor David King, presented MPs with a series of graphs based on computer predictions compiled by statisticians from the Imperial College of London, which coincidentally showed the epidemic skidding to a halt on the 7th of June, the exact date of the local elections. Both Tony Blair and his chief veterinarian, Jim Scudamore, made a number of visits to the countryside but only National Farmers Union officials, mainstream media, and carefully selected farmers were allowed to attend meetings. Farmers who opposed the cull were not invited, and those experts who gave advice contrary to government actions were ignored. During 2001, Peter Greenhill was given the task of valuing those herds that had been slaughtered. I asked Peter what his thoughts were in relation to the way foot and mouth was handled by the government and what his opinions were of Tony Blair's visit to Cumbria. I think you could describe it as a hand-picked audience. Um, a lot of people don't understand Cumbrian farmers. I'm not a Cumbrian, but I do understand these people are honest and straightforward and gentle people in many respects and would have given him a good hearing. Um, he, they never got that chance. He was whisked into a local hotel in Carlisle and, in fact, two of the senior officials were so scared they actually escaped out of the lavatory window. They wouldn't face the farmers. Do you think the general election played a big part in the way that staff were trying to manage the situation? We in this country have seen two miracles. The FMD disease stopped in its track twice. It's never happened in the world before. And the reason it stopped is called politics. The figures were fiddled to make it look as though it was in decline. There is no doubt at all that those figures were adjusted to suit an argument that Tony Blair was putting out because he wanted his election, because he could see it slipping away. There are lots and lots of accounts of um, meetings between farmers and officials which seem to be at the very extreme of rude. Um, people assume they had the absolute right to walk onto a farm um, without any good reason, um, that, which they don't have, of course. Um, but it, well, the relationship started off on a very bad footing. I think they'd reached a point of absolute panic, and I think their um, leaders, as it were, had said, here is a script, stick to it. There were one or two cases around the area. Um, I might tell you there probably was, a, a, not in my certain knowledge, but the, anecdotally there were animals barricaded in houses um, to avoid the officials, but they took the law, as it seemed, into their own hands and just barged into territories. It was only when we told the, um, the, the farmer that they people, if they wanted to come on their farm, had to get a court order, uh, because that's the law. And the policeman there is not as a part of endorsing what they were doing, he's there to keep the peace. I'm at complete loss to understand how on earth they, they got in the state they were. Um, it seemed that they, every time they tried to make an announcement, they, it, it, it failed. Um, I can only describe in the meeting that I was trying to um, uh, get to with two MEPs, and we, we got lost, we didn't understand it, and next thing we were, the, the road had been blocked by police cars, um, 
this is a, a, a just a, a general opening meeting with MAF. Uh, and they blocked it with police cars, and we noticed that two of the policemen were armed. Our names and addresses were taken, our car registrations were taken, um, photographs were taken. Richard Morsley is a retired hill farmer who was still working during the foot and mouth epidemic. Like most farmers affected by the outbreak, he has questioned the government's official story and why they ignored expert advice. There's always this horrible feeling that they were doing it simply to get rid of livestock. And if the odd farmer commits suicide, well, that's a bonus. They just didn't seem to want us. They didn't want to know us. Because I think somebody in, in uh, <coughs> the European Union has this funny idea that the east of England should be arable and the animals should be shoved over to the west. But basically, uh, we should make our money out of tourism or something. It doesn't fit in with an EU plan for us to have a, a good, vibrant livestock industry. Or arable, for that matter. You can only say it was ill-managed. I did get a letter in the Cumberland News where I point out what I just said, that no responsible minister of a responsible government or no servant of that minister could be so bloody stupid unless we're being told to be so stupid. And let it run, you know, let it go. All they did was chase it. They never, never really tried to catch up. It took a long time before they got round to a system of clean and dirty vets. So vets going from farm to farm were carrying the infection with them. Uh, some people would deny it, but it was absolutely true. It happened, it was recordable. And even the dirty vets on the farms, where there was pretty obvious cases of foot and mouth, they could go back and socialise with the vets who were on, working on clean farms. And we know that humans can carry the infection. They don't show it, but they can carry it. So again, how much was, it, how much was possibly spread that way? Two of the ministry's most senior scientists working on foot and mouth published a damning indictment of the contiguous cull in the veterinary record, arguing that much of the killing had been unnecessary. The decision to slaughter indiscriminately was not driven by experience of the farming industry, but by a group of mathematicians at the Imperial College of London who had compiled computer predictions based not upon any farming experience, but upon sexually transmitted diseases in people. This system was derided by many in the industry as political madness. The government's lessons learned inquiry that took place after the event accused ministers of gross mismanagement and of ignoring recommendations that had been made after the 1967 outbreak. According to a study compiled by Cardiff-based law professors David Campbell and Bob Lee, the government's controversial three-kilometer cull was illegal. On the day that Britain was officially declared disease-free, the Meat and Livestock Commission disputed the official figures by declaring that approximately six million animals had not been included in the final report. Tony Blair's government claimed that approximately four million animals had been culled between February and September of 2001. However, the commission said that it was more likely to be closer to 11 million. there were a further two million more animals slaughtered because there was not enough feed or space because the ministry would not allow animals to be moved to a neighboring field where there was fresh grass for the starving animals to eat. 
these otherwise healthy animals were slaughtered to prevent any further suffering. According to Jane Connor, economic forecaster at the Meat and Livestock Commission, a great number of animals were not accounted for because they were either killed with their mothers, which was counted as one animal, or because they were killed after foot and mouth closed their market, in which case they were not counted at all. In truth, it is impossible to know exactly how many animals were slaughtered beyond the official 4 million figure, a figure that is widely disputed within the industry. There are hundreds of thousands of these sheep, so uh, or millions. Um, so it's unlikely you're going to destroy the breed. But we we did actually. I think the whole uh, exercise took up 13% of the sheep population in this country. That's a huge figure, um, and it was not just in one lump. It was uh, spread right through the whole flock. The Cardiff University did a big report and said the the contiguous cull, dangerous contact, and uh, slaughter on suspicion was all illegal because you were supposed to have, you know, good proof that these animals were infected. But the trouble is, there was, was such a time delay between the samples being collected and being sent off to be tested, that what they were doing, if there was any suspicion, they would slaughter the animals. They would then get the samples back to say that they were all clear, but it was too late then. I think we just go back a little bit and say, what happened when they slaughtered the stock? Well, it's a big problem uh, to the uninitiated. A cow is a big animal. It's getting on for, in some cases, half a ton of meat. And when that drops, that's going to stay down there. They dropped all of the um, cows in the farmyard to the point where you couldn't move for corpses. Sheep the same way. You then had a blockage, you had path, pathways blocked. You, they had created a situation where people could hardly leave the farmhouse for dead, for dead bodies, and they were left there for considerable periods of time, not just days, but weeks. Animals were confined to farms, and they would have been brought down to the what we refer to as the in-by area, which is the area by the farm, and they were left there. There were terrible cases where the um, sheep had eaten out all the grass, and we couldn't get authority from, we try, even tried the minister to get <coughs> authority to move the, the sheep into the next field where there was grass. They were crying out for grass. They were starving and they still refused. It was cruelty of a grand scale. And I have evidence of that too from um, some of my colleagues. It's about as voluntary as the environmental schemes. Uh, if an official turns up with the backing of policemen, you tend to volunteer. You know, it's a threat almost. If you don't volunteer, we'll take them anyway. Or we'll do this, we'll do that, we'll do the other. It's the same with the environmental schemes. They're entirely voluntary. But they, they do the homework, they know exactly who on which common could do with a bit of money. And then they make it so plain that, well, if you don't all agree, nobody gets anything. And he makes you feel such a heel if you know so-and-so might go to the wall because you haven't signed. They said all about their, their um, health and safety and cleanliness and everything else and that animals would never be slaughtered in front of the others and so on. They must wear masks and gear and all the gubbins. Yeah. yeah. Didn't happen. In, in Wales, I think it's the Brecon Beacons, of thousands of sheep slaughtered because they tested as antibody positive. That means they've had contact. Now I have a neighbour, pretty ancient, ex-nurse, been a district nurse, she tests positive, uh, antibody positive to TB. But she says she's never had it. She's been in contact and her body's fought it and she, she's immune. So those sheep that were, were slaughtered because of antibody positive are the very ones we should have been breeding of. Do you think, in your opinion, do you think that the three kilometre kill zone, was that legal? No. What do you think their primary motivation was for following orders when they had a choice? To keep a job. Simple. 
And a pension. Public sector pensions are well worth having, aren't they? I wish I could get one. <laughs>
and a number of burial sites were earmarked around the country, one of which was Great Orton. Many pregnant sheep, or with lambs at foot, were transported to Great Orton, where they were shot and buried in numbers. Today, Great Orton, a place once dubbed as the animal Auschwitz of Cumbria, is a nature reserve. The only thing left visible on this site that can attest to what happened here is a plaque commemorating the animals that were slaughtered. It is claimed by many that the official figures are a gross miscalculation. The true figures run much higher. Newborns were not counted in the official figures. Tests showed that of the 115 farms whose animals ended their lives in Great Orton, only one sample tested positive, with one additional mild positive and three inconclusives. This means that less than 1% of farms around Great Orton actually tested positive for the foot and mouth disease. We were invited by a local resident to come and visit the site. Not only did he have first-hand experience of what happened on the ground during the epidemic, but he also campaigned and attended meetings during the outbreak. During 2001, he was subjected to assault and criminal damage and has asked us not to reveal his identity. I, as you know, I'd left the armed forces, uh, wanted to settle down in, in a sort of relatively simple life and do my photography and all this sort of stuff. And everything was going very, very well. We'd been up here, what, three years at that time, something like that. And then suddenly we were hit by foot and mouth and it, and it just swept us along. It was like going on a very, very fast train. And, to, and, it, and it pushed me into areas I unwittingly sort of came across because, as I said to you before, I believe that if we lived in a democracy. I believe that the vast majority of people in charge of our services in this country, whether it be MAF, DEFRA, vets, judges and so on, I believe they were good upstanding people beyond reproach. Well, suddenly, coming from a service background as a warrant officer, suddenly I had a brutal awakening. If you arrived on a site, say, say we heard through the internet that there was a killing going on in a certain village, then I'd normally just drive down with my gear, all film in those days. and. Uh, if you got the camera out in front of any, they, they didn't like it. And I can understand why. Remember, a lot of these lads in the early days, they hadn't got the right licensing. They had illegal firearms. They were badly maintained. It was chaos. There should have been vets on site and all this. They weren't there. So the whole thing was a, a shamble. So that was one reason they were so concerned. Suddenly you have a guy pitching up with a camera. And a friend of mine in, where, in the village I lived in at the time, Actually, and his farm has been culled out now, by now. And uh, he told me, uh, <laughs> you're quite famous up at Carlisle. They got pictures of you on the wall. And I was like, man wanted. If you see this man, run a mile sort of thing, which is quite interesting, really. You know, seeing I served my country for 26 years, put my neck on the line on many occasions, etc., etc. You know, which is fine. I didn't mind that. But suddenly I was being treated as, as, as uh, something very nasty. Well, I wasn't. All I was doing was telling the truth and taking the pictures. And I, I came across uh, some sheep that had clearly been killed very quickly. I mean, you can kind of tell, you know. And um, the stench of disinfectant was everywhere. And the stench of death. You know, when you've had a job in the forces to an extent, you, get, you pick up this smell. And I arrived there and I had my camera. I left my car by the road. It's just a little road. I looked over the fence. There were all these dead ewes. They were all heavily pregnant. And out of the corner of my eye, I saw some movement. And the hairs on the back of my head really went up when I saw this. And I walked over, and what I saw consistently amongst this pile of dead ewes were aborted fetus. They were, they were all heavily pregnant, they were aborting. And in one particular case, I saw this fetus moving. I, it may have been breathing, I guess.
another time uh, I had a camera smashed. And, uh, you know, you're, I was always on my own, and uh, obviously because I didn't want to implicate anybody else. The other thing they used to do was, um, every time I left my house, <laughs> strangely, I'd be followed. I was followed by different vehicles. You could pick them up. And because of the stuff I'd done in the past, you know, and my training and all the rest of it, I used to have a bit of sport with that. But going back to 2001, you know, these things live on forever. When I saw the, the use coming off the, off the trucks here and they were aborting, I mean, it just seemed something like out of a, a horror movie. This is, you know, these were the green and pleasant, lush fields of England. And yet we were seeing something enacted that I couldn't believe would happen in England. And it did. And the result of this massive cull here, which was, which was, was a holocaust. I mean, that's how we can describe it. Peter Greenhill described this place as the Auschwitz of England, and it was. He described that to an EC committee, and they were mortified. They tried to shut him up. Now, I've got, in Hansard, there's a bit in there, one of the MPs says, a preemptive cull was not legal. Preemptive cull was not legal, but a voluntary cull was legal. That's why they call it voluntary. Voluntary, you know, like you volunteer, then it's not illegal. That's what they were doing. Yeah. Now, a lot of the vets, a lot of the vets did stand up and argue this and did, did make this point and say it was disgusting and, and the rest of it. But they, were, they, were, they seemed to be suppressed by the state. They were just dismissed. So what you had then, they would go around to the farms, they'd look at the sheep, and of course they were misdiagnosing the sheep because they weren't using the real-time PCRs that were offered to them that could do it in 15 minutes. They were trying to do it on clinical signs. So they were killing animals that were never infected. And so what you had, that became then became an infected premise. So guess what happens then? You have an infected premise that wasn't, but that means that all the local farms within 3K were going to be killed out, everything. And not only that, they then had the voluntary cull. And what they, they called it voluntary. They had a very, very nasty veneer just below the surface, as we found out. They were asking farmers to voluntarily bring their sheep here to be killed, just down here. And some did and some didn't. Those that didn't were immediately threatened. And DEFRA sent them a letter, it was written by Nikki Ellis. And she said, basically she said in the letter, you know, it's, it's a voluntary cull, but if you don't do it, we're going to make it. And on the back of that letter as well, we know that they were told, because it happened to some friends of mine, if you don't give up your sheep, if you don't bring them to Great Orton, we will come on your farm, we will kill all your animals, including your dairy herd, and we're going to charge you for it. That's what they said. When they started burying them here, behind us, all around here, uh, in this area, over there, but they were, they were big holes dug, and the animals were just... You've got pictures of them. They, the lorries would turn up, and they'd just open the thing, and they'd all fall in. The pits weren't lined, they didn't have any lime in them and all the stuff that was recommended by engineers here. I spoke to an engineer here that gave DEFRA, this is how you do it, was ignored. Came in here and up until recently, and in fact you spoke to the guy today about it, the, the, they would have uh, the leachate drained from this very airfield into the waterways of Cumbria and down the rivers out into the Solway over there. And that had a massive environmental impact, as you can imagine. Given his extensive experience of foot and mouth in Cumbria, I asked him whether he thought the government had acted with incompetence or whether there was something more behind the events of 2001. It wasn't chaos. It, it, it was done deliberately and it's part of destroying the agriculture in this country to control it. And we, but we know that's what they want to do because the EC have said that's what they want to do. They want this country to be the centre of finance and tourism. And I leave anybody who listened to this, when you get this documentary out, I would ask them to just look at the facts. And when we call these people incompetent, they might be incompetent members of these agencies, but they're actually very clever. They're very skilled and they know exactly what they're doing. And we didn't realise this at the time, but the, the heads of DEFRA and MAF and the heads of state would have known exactly what they were doing. We know for a fact that MAF were inquiring about wood, at various wood yards, including Staff the Staffordshire wood yard, because I rang them and talked to them. They were inquiring about wood supplies in the summer of 2000. But when, when MAF were asked about this, DEFRA, 
they said, oh, it's just routine. We always do it. And when we spoke to all the wood yards, they'd never done it before. So that's a lie. That's an out and out lie. Well, whatever the reason, it's a lie. We also know, because uh, we spoke to the printer, he was an Irish lad actually, and the printing business was in Ireland. He was approached by the state to print the various signs. You know, the, I can give you one which says foot and mouth, no access, and this type of thing. He was asked to print those in the summer of 2000. And I also spoke to a worker from Plysu, that was called Plysu then, and they're a plastics company, a big plastics company, their headquarters are in Milton Keynes. And one of the lads rang me up and said, we were really, really pleased when we got a new contract from MAF. So I said, what sort of stuff? He said, oh, bottles, plastic buckets, you know, suits, that sort of stuff. I said, when was this? Just to reiterate, and he said, well, it was just before Christmas of 2000. The following day, we were taken out into the countryside where we were shown areas in which wild deer roam throughout the fells. These areas are not sectioned off and the deer are able to roam in the same areas that livestock graze. Deer are cloven-footed animals and susceptible to foot and mouth. However, the government did nothing to minimize their contact nor did they aggressively slaughter deer as they did livestock, causing many in the industry to suspect that the disease itself was not the target, but the farming industry itself. Where we are now um, in this beautiful hamlet, um, centre of, you know, um, uh, of our fell farming here in this area, and down the valley there, there are extensive uh, deer herds, red deer. And uh, these deer are cloven-footed animals. And uh, a lot of farmers thought they were going to be a big problem in foot and mouth, clearly, because they, they wander uh, all over the place, you know, ranging. They range right over High Street uh, down to um, Mardell Head and wandering extensively over the land. They could spread foot and mouth disease, one would, one would uh, think, very, very easily, but of course, those herds were never taken out by DEFRA and people questioned it. So you could, drawing a conclusion on that, suggest that actually they were attacking farming and not the disease. What we've seen is a steady, continuous, and I would call it quite violent pressure on agriculture in the country, similar to what we we've seen in, in fishing. So we're seeing this model replicated. I mentioned the model yesterday, and we're seeing the model replicated. And um, so what we're seeing here is we're seeing an industry torn apart, like mining was, and we're having young kids um, living on the farms with their parents, and the traditional way of passing down the knowledge and expertise, that traditional route would clearly be where the, uh, the farmer, the, the, the father of that particular farm would pass on the knowledge to the children. Well, what's happening now is because the children and, and the parents are recognizing that farming has no future, the children are now saying, I don't want to go into farming, and they're disappearing and maybe leaving the areas. And so consequently, all of these communities here, we've got farms down here on the right, you can see the head, there's farms at the head of the valley here, there's other farms over on the right. All these farms are going to disappear. Whilst many countries suffer outbreaks of foot and mouth disease, none have handled an outbreak as badly as the UK government did in 2001. Other countries nurse their animals to health because as we shall hear, foot and mouth is not terminal and is in fact much like the common flu virus. With this in mind, it is difficult to understand why the government reacted as violently as it did. Cattle are badly affected by foot and mouth. Um, they look and 
uh, they look dejected, they, they, they excessive dribbling from the nose, their feet are paint really sore. But in respect of sheep, the particular breed of sheep we have here are the Herdwicks, who lived their lives on top of the fells, and they're extremely tough. They were bred for uh, tough conditions. For them, it seemed like a rather bad cold. They, they sneezed and coughed and looked a bit dejected, but a few days later they picked up. Um, this was, information was relayed to MAF, but as usual, ignored. The virus, by all accounts, is incredibly easily killed. A very slight change in the pH, either up or down, is quite enough. Uh, there's a lot of people who tell you that after they've had foot and mouth, although the animal might recover, it's of no further economic use. She won't milk, she won't fatten or anything else. But going back to an outbreak in Cheshire in the 1920s, the Duke of Westminster's prize shorthorn herd got it. And they went slaughtered. In those days, of course, labour was a lot cheaper and more plentiful. But the cow's feet and mouths were washed two or three times daily with saline. Uh, the cows recovered and were winning in the shows by the autumn. I have to match that with it. In India, this disease is known and they nursed their cattle out of it. But we were talking of a disease by this time which was well entrenched. Fred Brown began his foot and mouth career in 1955 at the Purbright Institute, where he studied the composition of the virus until 1989, before joining the Plum Island Animal Disease Center in America. His advice was to set up a perimeter and vaccinate from the outside in to ensure that the virus did not escape. The government ignored this and continued to make matters worse by culling from the inside out, which, like the pyres, help the virus to spread. MAF also turned down a diagnostic field test that Fred Brown had brought with him from the Plum Island Institute in America. Once ratified, the device could have given a conclusive result on site, eliminating the need for slaughter on suspicion and lengthy laboratory tests. We understood that uh, Professor Fred Brown had one of these new machines, the PCR machine, which he brought, it was his personal property, which he brought in from his place in Plum Island um, in the United States. And with a view to help, he approached um, MAF and said, we need to do some um, comparative tests between what I can find with my machine and what you found. And they said they were far too busy handling foot and mouth and couldn't be bothered with him, and said goodbye. Um, at some time, he loaned them his machine um, which, when he asked for it back, it was in pieces. Between 1952 and 1992, countries within the European Union successfully controlled the virus through vaccination. Whilst there are many people asking very pertinent questions of vaccinations and their safety, it is interesting to note that Britain vaccinates many of its animals on a routine basis, as well as imports vaccinated meat from all over the world. MAF stated that vaccinated animals would become infected and the vaccine was too slow. But as Fred Brown suggested, once a vaccinated perimeter was set up, the virus would have been under control within four to five days and prevented the slaughter of millions of healthy animals. Despite our views on vaccination, it is imperative that we look beyond our opinions to the uncharacteristic actions of the authorities in control of this onslaught in order to understand what the foot and mouth outbreak was really about. We must then ask, why would a government that routinely promotes vaccination choose not to vaccinate in a time of crisis? Actually, after the Northumberland report, when we had uh, foot and mouth in 67, 
they were saying that um, some type of vaccination should be used and also the animals must be buried in quicklime. But of course we'd had an EU directive which said you now couldn't do this. Farmers are good at, at vaccinating animals, they do it all their lives. Mm. <clears throat> For some unforeseen reason, math believed that farmers could not do it. It is beyond imagination. One of the things about vaccination, we were told, oh, nobody would want to eat vaccinated meat. It'll be a, it'll be a two-tier market. I think this was one of the things put out by the NFU. But somebody else pointed out, if you go into a supermarket and buy a tin of corned beef, it's either had foot and mouth or it's been vaccinated. Nearly all the meat coming in from South America is either potentially a carrier or it's been vaccinated. Nobody bothers. Nearly every lamb that you, goes on your plate has been vaccinated against something, but nobody bothers. I simply don't know why they wouldn't take any notice of the world experts, there were three of them, um, who said, why on earth aren't you doing this? They were vaccinating in Argentina, they were vaccinating all through South America and certain places in Africa. So why on earth weren't we doing it? There was just no common sense answer. The behaviour of those at senior levels of government during the foot and mouth outbreak of 2001 suggests that what happened was not a result of incompetence or negligence, but that there was method within the madness of Blair and his ministers. Agriculture Secretary Nick Brown ignored the advice of foot and mouth experts disregarded the findings of the 1969 Northumberland report, in which it was highlighted that the pyres would encourage the disease to spread, and ordered a three-kilometre cull from the inside out against expert opinion, which also encouraged the disease to spread further. Statistical data was massaged and, in some cases, completely distorted from the truth in order to keep the public from knowing what was actually happening across the country. Stocks of wood were acquired, signs printed and suits ordered well in advance of the first recorded incident. MAF implemented a slaughter on suspicion policy that resulted in the destruction of millions of healthy animals. The policy was later found to be illegal and cost the taxpayer an estimated £20 billion. In 2007, the government was blamed for causing a further outbreak of foot and mouth when it was reported that the virus had escaped from the Institute of Animal Health at Purbright. A month later, there was a further mishandling of the virus when it escaped from a licensed laboratory at Muriel. A virus could only have broken out on the island if it was imported or if it had managed to somehow find its way out of a laboratory, as it did in 2007. To date, the true source for the 2001 outbreak is unconfirmed. I have seen something that was written by a journalist that I uh, had some dealings with in the northeast, that in the October before Foot and Mouth, um, Plum Island, which is the US Department of Agriculture equivalent to Purbright here, and Purbright were running some experiment there. I think that they were trying to get one vaccine that would cover all the seven serotypes of uh, foot and mouth, plus their sort of variations of those serotypes. And according to this information, a, a virus, uh, went missing from Purbright.
The government claimed that a pig farmer from Hedden on the Wall caused the outbreak, suggesting that he had used pig swill that contained illegally imported meat that he had acquired from a Chinese restaurant. The Chinese community was so outraged by this that they protested outside MAF headquarters. An embarrassed Nick Brown had to submit an apology and Tony Blair had to grovel to the Chinese community. Despite these claims being proven untrue, Pigswill was banned and the courts continued to prosecute the pig farmer. Trading Standards submitted false evidence in court, stating that they had found unprocessed waste on the pig farm, despite the fact that the farm had already been professionally cleaned days before their arrival, following a report that had condemned the conditions the pigs were living in. The evidence was thrown out of court, but the farmer was still convicted on nine charges under the Animal Health Act. He was never formally charged with causing the outbreak. It was later discovered that ministry vets had reported seeing older lesions in sheep that predated the Hedden on the Wall case. However, by then, Blair's government had snared their scapegoat. The true cause of the outbreak may never be known, but the after effects of what happened in 2001 continue to affect the lives of many farming families still to this day. I think the most graphic example I want to leave you with is how did this affect individual people? Um, it affected this household very much because my wife and I were both working in separate um, units to try and get some sense out of this and it, it really did upset us but we had a very large farmer who um, used my company and he was well over six feet tall about 25 stone and he, and he was not a man who, who made great show of anything I was walking up the street and I knew he'd lost his stock and I thought how do I deal with this man he so showed me the answer he flung his arms around my neck and cried like a baby mm. in public Drive a man to that level, and you, you have seen, you know, the devil. Some of the worst part for me, personally, was actually listening to these farmers when I was ringing round. Um, you know, the, the state they were in, it, 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 and some of the stories and things that they were telling you. I mean, I used to go to bed at night and just cry. And then when we started Heart of Cumbria, um, reading those poems and seeing the, the pictures that the kids had drawn, absolutely terrible. Um, I mean, there was a little boy here. They killed his, his fa uh, father's uh, milking herd. He, he didn't, he, I think he was about two and a half. He didn't speak for 18 months. I mean, I know the, the farmer. Um, that, that sort of thing. But the other thing, I think, was that it made you realise that you didn't trust anybody because the police were behaving in a heavy-handed way. Um, the army. I mean, there was a lady up in the borders. She had some zwarble sheep. I think it was only about six. She locked them in her living room. They broke the door down, took the sheep out and killed them. Um, because looking at bald figures, you know, this 700,000 odd um, specimens that were sent to Purbright, and yet there was only 300 that came back positive, which was given by Fred Brown to us. That's just a figure. It, it's, it's the human story.
65 farmers committed suicide, and many more gave up farming as a result of losing their entire stock. Following the 2001 foot and mouth outbreak, Parliament passed the 2002 Animal Health Act, which purports to allow government officials unfettered access to all and any premises with the freedom to cull any animal, voluntarily or not. No evidence is needed to declare any farm an infected place. Simply a notice by virtue of an order under the Animal Health Act is evidence enough, whether there is real evidence of infection or not. Addressing the House of Lords in regards to the Animal Health Act, Lord Willoughby de Broke stated, the powers the government seek in this bill are the dreams of dictators. Through the drive and manipulation of media, outbreaks such as foot and mouth serve to aggravate public concern, which, in turn, gives governments the excuse to create new legislation, such as the Animal Health Act. These policies often cripple small producers, which enable giant agribusinesses to take further control of the food market. Following numerous scandals within the farming industry, many smaller, independent farms have gone out of business, which has increased the market share and thus profits of factory farms, where huge numbers of animals are kept in small spaces and are more prone to disease and malnutrition. Many in the industry believe that the destruction of traditional farming is deliberate and they point to the privatisation of Britain's public services and assets as evidence that it is a clandestine policy of government to strip Britain of its ability to sustain itself. A weakened Britain will become more dependent on the EU and vulnerable to privatisation, both of which serve the few and not the many. To illustrate what happens to small farms once giant businesses take over, we only have to look at supermarkets to see a glimpse into the future. I think you've got a different culture. I mean, if you take the French farmers, the French farmers will always gather together and start a strike and blockade this, and, and the French government, you know, never want to really step on their toes because they know the power. But you've got that connection with food, I think, with the French. And and farming. We have this wonderful kind of fairy story um, idea of landscape uh, seen at a, a distance and we, I think we've become so urbanised and most of the population are detached. Yes, they love to come and look at that but they don't understand how it's evolved and how important it is. And we've also and I think, sadly, one of the major things is since they even started or stopped uh, teaching children to cook in school, it's, it's supermarket buying. That, I mean, we've got children up here who don't know where milk comes from. Uh, it's quite terrifying. Or, you, you know, you show them a raw vegetable and they've got no idea what it is because it, it all comes out of a supermarket. It's packed and you stuff it in the microwave and that's it. These enterprises demand such low prices from farmers that many small, independent farms can no longer survive in these incredibly hostile markets, granting further market share to giant multinationals. Quality is almost always exchanged for quantity, with food becoming ever more nutritionally defunct, as the only businesses that can supply food with such high margins of profit are those same giant food corporations who can employ such grand economies of scale because they've routinely reduced quality in the name of cutting costs in order to increase their profit margins. Our ministers are failing us, 
but it is our responsibility to make sure that our interests are heard. Whilst the greater many of us remain silent, the only opinions that are being noted are those that belong to lobbying groups and acquaintances of government leaders. None of these groups serve the public interest. If we lose the means to produce our own food, we lose food security, leaving this nation vulnerable to giant multinational agribusinesses and their private aspirations of profit and complete domination of the natural world. It is our responsibility to ensure that our food is protected, as well as producing our own where we can and supporting local farms and farmers that adhere to a code of ethics and quality, we must be sure that those that have been instructed with the responsibility of maintaining a healthy farming industry do so, at the benefit of farmers and the wider population, and not for the benefit of a few. If we do not act fast and support our local farmers, British farming will be a thing of the past. <laughs>